Well, thanks for having me. This is uh, actually the second time I've got to do this at uh, Texas A&M. It's always been very nice. What I'm going to talk to you today about is, uh, is really mucilage, but Fred wouldn't let me put it in the title. He didn't think you guys would come, so that's why it's a sticky situation. I'm going to start out talking about Chia because that's how I got into this area, and then I'll continue on and give you a, a little more about uh, mucilage and seeds. Uh, many people will recognize Chia because of the Chia pet, right? Uh, so very nicely it sticks to the paper. I can almost do anything with, with chia. It sticks, sticks to almost anything. It's because of that mucilage. Uh, so this is what mucilage looks like. Uh, you can see the two technical terms. It, it actually has evolved. The same type of thing has evolved from pericarp walls as well as from seed coats. Uh, I really had no idea, uh, well, anyway, from the pictures that you can see here, Arabidopsis does this, so there, we know a fair amount about mucilage for that reason. Uh, psyllium is what they make metamucil out of, and then flax also has uh, mucilage for its fiber content. I didn't realize how many plants made mucilage, and how many different organs, and especially not how many different species of seeds do this. Uh, but basically this mucilage is, is a, a very hydrophilic, it's a pectinaceous polysaccharide. And as you'll see here as we go through, it comes out of the seed quite quickly upon imbibition. And everyone knows basil, right? Well, this is what basil looks like just a few minutes after it, it's impacted on water. Uh, it swells up and is covered up in mucilage. Uh, we got interested in chia. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, it is part of the Lamiaceae, and there are lots of species in the Lamiaceae. Not all of them make mucilage in their seeds, interestingly enough, but many of them do. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this so we're all on the same page as to what we're talking about. Uh, this is what it, uh, seed production looks like in chia um, and, and many of the other Lamiaceae. They form these little nutlets inside this sheath. Uh, so each one of these is actually an individual fruit. So the tissue we're going to be talking about is pericarp tissue rather than seed coats. And I'll say seed, 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 but recognize what we're really talking about is, is a modification here of the, the fruit seed complex. She has got a lot of publicity recently uh, because of its health food uh, dynamics. It is one of the best, if not the best, source of vegetative omega-3 fatty acids. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, when you get into this, you find out all kinds of things you didn't recognize. Uh, most of the little tablets you take for fatty acid uh, omegas comes from krill. We're over-harvesting krill, which is impacting whale and other mammalian uh, ocean-going creatures. So we're hoping that things like chia get into the mainstream production for omega-3. Uh, it is already available. You can see Mama Chia over there. Um, they make it into a drink. That's six fifty or seven dollars for that. So uh, it is interestingly enough one of the most important Mesoamerican pre-Columbian foodstuffs. And you can read all about how important it was to that, that uh, area at the time. And you have to ask the question, why didn't it become more of a domesticated crop uh, that we were eating routinely, like corn and, and other things that were domesticated uh, out of that Mesoamerica? Well, the problem is that it, we did not have the genetics inherent for day-neutral flowering. It is a long day plant, and under most temperate conditions, it flowers so late that it doesn't make a fruit crop before the first frost, and it is very frost tender. So in a place like Kentucky or the Midwest, this was a non-viable crop. Uh, so the plant breeder that, that we work with, he went through a mutagenesis study, and he was able to recover several lines of day-neutral chia. 
and we've selected a few of those that they have some seed patents for and you can see it being produced here in Kentucky uh, we, we make a, a crop routinely now from these, this new genetics so they asked me to become involved with this because we we're looking now at essentially a new crop for our area and they wanted to have they wanted to know a little more about the seed biology and so that's where I got involved and quite quickly you can see that it's to me was unique from other agronomic crops we were growing because it very quickly produces this mucilage and so we then got interested in mucilage production and it occurs quite quickly so this is just a, a, a graph here that shows the area of the seed increase or the mucilage increase and it all occurs within two hours it's pretty much the mucilage is, is, is expanded as much as it's going to expand uh, you can stain it with tualidine blue and a couple of other stains and you can quite nicely see the mucilage and the extent of the mucilage and literally if it sees water it ruptures it's a very quick phenomenon and so here hopefully you can see that so this is a time lapse that occurs in less than two minutes and as soon as the mucilage hits the dilute solution of quality in blue it changes color and that's how you can see it so the real question was seems to me that this plant is investing quite a bit in mucilage production what does it have to do with germination what's its impact on germination and so we started to study chia from that dimension we're not the only ones that study this as like I said there are lots of plant species that that make this but it's kind of interesting when you get down here and ask the question what do people think it does well there's some water retention that obviously occurs from this there's something going on here that 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 changes the the water dynamics uh, I'm kind of interested in this protection of biotic and abiotic stress. Uh, there's really good evidence out of Israel that the mucilage sticks these desert species. A lot of these species occur in arid areas. Uh, again, so you, you get that water connection, but also they think that the mucilage kind of glues the seed in place. And so when you get these torrential rains, the monsoons come through you don't wash every seed out in, in, into, the, into the sea uh, roots routinely make mucilage and so there's an obvious connection there as to what the radical might use mucilage for as it penetrates soil uh, it sticks to animals and so it can be a dispersal mechanism uh, it may uh, increase or decrease oxygen diffusion uh, so you, you might be impacting the, the atmosphere around the seed. And then an interesting one on DNA repair. And that, that really is an, an interesting paper. That the mucilage actually is helping in those repair mechanisms that seeds have to routinely go through in order to germinate uh, at a high level. So we, we embarked on this then and we looked at some of those aspects. So let me share that with you now. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can wash the mucilage off so what people do in these studies is they either physically rub it off or you can use an acid solution and in a, a very short period of time the mucilage comes out the seed really hasn't imbibed that much and so you can take it off and the seed now is still more or less dry uh, so the first thing we did is compared the acid just to rubbing it off and there was really no difference so this is much easier to get more seed clean this way from the mucilage so that's the way we've handled our seeds so these are the studies that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you today uh, the first one will deal with hydration dehydration then we'll look at germination under optimal conditions versus germination under simulated water stress We'll look at also wetting and drying cycles and see how that might impact germination. 
and then uh, take a real quick stab at what might be going on uh, as relationship to biotic stress. So let's start out here first with the dehydration. I showed you the hydration curve and you can see that it hydrates quite a bit uh, but if you would compare the, the level of fresh weight between seeds that have no mucilage versus seeds that have mucilage, you can see it's quite different, right? And then as you just allow them to air dry over time, on this scale you can hardly see the dehydration occur without... Uh, you can hardly see the dehydration occur in the seeds without mucilage but you get this nice gradual decline. So you can imagine in an arid environment with intermittent water that you might stay more hydrated between rain events, for instance, or drying cycles by drying more slowly. So this could be one thing that that mucilage is doing for you. We wanted to compare then mucilage containing seeds with non-mucilage containing seeds under optimal conditions for germination. So in this experiment here, all we're looking at is time after imbibition, 26, 48 hours, with and without mucilage, and I'm going to measure germination and radical length. And so Quite obviously, and you'll see this a number of other times through the slides we go through, the seeds germinate more quickly if they contain mucilage. The other thing is, because they start germination more quickly, the radical is longer at the same given time. The other thing you want to note here is that ultimate germination is not impacted by whether mucilage is there or not. In order to uh, simulate water stress, we often use this increasing PEG uh, type experiment. So on water, this is what we just saw just previously, right? They germinate a little more quickly, but ultimately you end up with the same germination percentage. So seeds germinate faster when they contain mucilage versus when they do not. As we increase the PG to negative 2.5 to negative 5.0, what you can see is it does not have a big impact on whether the seeds have or do not have mucilage, but germination, early germination is reduced. But we don't see a difference between whether you have mucilage or whether you don't. It isn't until we get into a more severe uh, restriction of water that you can see a slight improvement in the presence of mucilage. And it really is not that big a difference. It's repeatable, but it's not a big difference. I don't think it's a big enough difference to invest so much resources into producing mucilage. So we question whether this is really what's going on or not. Another interesting phenomenon here was that if you looked at the morphology of the mucilage, or at least the presence of the mucilage, at 0.25 megapascals you can see the seeds germinate, they produce mucilage. But if you increase to 0.5 or, or even greater, the mucilage does not get produced and germination is delayed. So this is kind of an interesting thing because if you're thinking about whether the mucilage can be a moisture retaining type of a tissue, then it cannot have a more negative water potential than the seed does. Otherwise, it would never give any more any water to the developing seed for radical emergence. So what this seems to indicate is that at a water potential where the mucilage is not absorbing water, the embryo still is, and it absorbs enough water to complete radical emergence. 
So you can imagine in a more hydrated situation, as the soil environment starts to dehydrate, you could actually be moving water from the hydrated mucilage to the seed. The reason this is kind of interesting is back in the 80s, when hydrogels came out, there was a fair amount of research suggesting that maybe we can just put hydrogel around seeds. And then if you get into a dry situation in the field, the hydrogel would provide moisture for the seed to germinate. Well, it was just the opposite because the hydrogel had a more negative water potential, and so it was actually taking water out of the seed <laughs> to stay hydrated. It doesn't look like the mucilage is doing that, so that's why, to me, that's an interesting result. So the question was then, what happens, in, in, not in a simulated drought stress, but something that was more real world? Obviously, this is not Chia in the environment, but uh, we often do this kind of a stair-step experiment when we want to do this. Um, right now, my class, I'm teaching plant propagation, so we're doing the same thing to illustrate the impact of water on germination for the students. It's a very simple system. We have a reservoir here. That's the PVC pipe for the reservoir. We have a capillary mat that goes into the reservoir. And then you just use uh, styrofoam or wood, you can use almost anything you want to create the stair step effect. So this is higher from the perched water table. So the higher you are from the perched water table, the drier the, the mat is, the less water goes into the container. And so you can, you, the, the seeds and seedlings here will be at a drier moisture content and these will be actually quite wet. It's a very simple thing, and it's, it's great for our students. So when you do that, you get a range from 95% of sat saturated substrate to 60% of saturated substrate. And when you look at the germination, at the very moist conditions, this can be stressful for germination as well, and you can see that the mucilage uh, producing seeds are behaving at a higher level than uh, the seedlings that emerge on the uh, with, without mucilage. Even after seven days, it's not as uh, profound a difference, but you still see it. Then at the dry conditions, we get something that's even more uh, illustrative of what the mucilage might be doing. So you get twice as much emergence at the dry conditions with seeds that had mucilage and did not. And even after seven days, this is still persisting. So it does look like the mucilage is probably imparting some kind of an advantage to the seeds as they germinate in a, at least this is a soilless environment, but, but at least a substrate environment. The next experiment then that, that we wanted to run was an experiment that looked at wet and dry cycles. So again, in an arid environment at least, you might imagine that seeds might be exposed to a, a brief rain shower and they would hydrate, dehydrate, and this might go on for a number of cycles. And so this is what we did. We, we uh, hydrated for two hours, dehydrated for 22, and we did this for four days. And this is just illustrating the, uh, the cycles. If you look at what the seed looks like, this is what it looks like when it's dry. The mucilage still sticks. I wasn't sure that the mucilage wouldn't crystallize and break off. No, it stays right there. It adheres to the seed. When you hydrate it again, it looks just like it did before. It pumps up. The results we get from this are really pretty dramatic. Um, so if, if you look at without the drying cycles, uh, we don't see that much difference here. But after true drying cycles, we're getting 77% of the seeds to germinate versus 14. And after four drying cycles, again, the, the seeds with the mucilage are still uh, germinating at a very high percentage while the seeds without mucilage are not. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, this is 
reminiscent of a seed priming effect where if you remember back to that dehydration curve that I showed you, when you dehydrate chia with the mucilage, it's a slow, 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 slow. And then it reaches a low water content, you irrigate again, and so it hydrates and slow, slow, slow. So that is a lot like seed priming. The work that I showed you previously that said uh, mucilage may be involved in DNA repair, that was alluding to this a priming effect. Because one of the things that can happen during priming is that you will get cellular repair, including DNA repair during that priming effect. So this again could be something that the mucilage is actually doing. And the other thing from that, if I didn't mention it, doesn't impact final germination, right? The seeds don't die during the drying cycle in the non-mucilage producing seed. All right, if we move on from there then uh, and get to, to treating the seeds a little bit barely, uh, badly, so what we wanted to do then is look at uh, an accelerated aging as a way of, of, of seeing whether these seeds tolerate abiotic stress with mucilage better than without mucilage. So I thought I'd describe what accelerated aging was for everyone. It's, it's one of these tests that we use for seed vigor. So we place the seeds on a wire mesh. If they're small seeds, we put them in that little bit of nylon. And then we put water or a saturated salt solution in that box. We cover it up. It then gets moved to an accelerated aging chamber. This is a chamber that has a water jacket. It has a very minimal fluctuation in temperature. Uh, so it holds the temperature at 41 or whatever we set it at very well. We hold it there for 72 or 96 hours and then we pull it out and we look to see what kind of germination there is. Uh, when we do this as a vigor test, if it's high vigor seed, they tolerate this condition. If it's low vigor seed, uh, you see a big impact on germination. So we did this both with uh, straight accelerated aging, which is water in the little box, and we also did it with saturated salts. We use saturated salts with the small vegetable and flower seeds because in water they just absorb too much water and they cannot tolerate the higher temperatures. So what this graph is about is moisture content. It's not germination. It's moisture content. So after 72 or 96 hours, when they're suspended over water, they absorb quite a bit of water. When they're suspended over the saturated salts, you get minimal water uptake. So we're interested now to see what the impact is on that, on that temperature perturbation in that hydrated versus non-dehydrated condition. So this now is germination percentage. And when we do germination percentage, you can see with mucilage, even in the straight accelerated aging treatment, where the moisture content was quite high, we still have pretty good germination in the seeds with mucilage, uh, but without mucilage, the seeds are, are starting to die. In the saturated salts, which is a little less perturbation on the seeds than the straight saturated salts, we see something very similar. Uh, and you can see that there's very little impact of the aging on seeds that produce mucilage. But those seeds that do not produce mucilage, you can see, you lose half of the germination or it goes down to 20%. This is reminiscent of what we would see in a high vigor and a low vigor seed lot. Obviously, that's not, it's the same seed lot. The only difference now is one produces mucilage and the other does not. So the mucilage is doing something uh, under these hot, moist conditions. And again, it, whether that's linked to many of these species that are arid uh, species. This is where most of the mucilage producers 
Not all, but many of the new sewage producers are native. The second way we wanted to look at this is a, a kind of a hybrid experiment here. This is one that looks at abiotic and biotic stress simultaneously. It's a modification of another vigor test. This one we call a cold test. What we do is we put uh, seeds in soil on top of a Kim pack. We go ahead then and moisten it. We put it at a chilling temperature of 10 degrees for six days. After that, we bring it out, move it to a, a, a more optimal condition for germination, and we see what happens. So we're, we're putting two types of stresses on the seed now. The first stress is the chilling, right? The second stress is the fact that there's microorganisms in the soil. And so we're looking at then that hybrid I told you, that, the, that mix of abiotic and biotic stresses. Uh, so this, the data in this gets a little bit complicated, but I think if you just look at the statistics, it boils it all out. Because we ran a factorial here of conditions that had soil, didn't have soil, had chilling, didn't have chilling, that kind of thing. And what it comes down to is if there's soil present, the microorganisms will reduce germination in these seeds, with or without mucilage. If you chill them, for that length of time under that situation, you're going to reduce germination. Uh, and there's an interaction between the soil and the chilling. The chilling doesn't have as big an effect without the soil. But mucilage didn't care. Whether it had mucilage or didn't have mucilage, you didn't see that impact. The idea here was, I was hoping, that the uh, mucilage would be modifying the rhizosphere or the, the soil environment around the seed and what we would be doing is re reducing the impact that any potential pathogens would have on seed germination. Uh, but at least in this experiment we didn't see that. So we're going to try to follow up on that but that's what we have so far. So to kind of sum up here now, so what do we know? We know that seeds dehydrate more slowly if they have mucilage. They germinate more quickly. Under simulated water condition, uh, stress conditions and in the greenhouse water stress conditions, we were getting faster and higher emergence with mucilage. We get uh, a, a priming effect for lack of a better way of describing that, when we go through wetting and drying cycles. It appears that seeds with mucilage tolerate heat stress a little better with mucilage, but not so with cold stress or chilling stress. And the mucilage, at least in that one experiment, does not seem to indicate that the mucilage imparts uh, much advantage towards a biotic stress. Okay, so that takes us through kind of the experimental work that we did with Chia. Um, I learned an awful lot about mucilage and what it might do and might not do. But then we tried to have a little fun by looking at uh, additional seeds in the Lamiaceae. I just we became very interested in this because it is the mucilage part of these seeds that imparts the um, nutritional benefit of having high fiber. And so we were looking then at seeds, a number of seeds that are in the Lamiaceae that produce mucilage to see what type of fiber they had, which ones might be better or less viscous, those kinds of things that, that are done in, in those kinds of studies. So remember back, I told you there are lots of species in the Lamiaceae. Some produce mucilage, some do not. And it, it's just, again, to me quite fascinating that within the same genus, Chia makes quite a bit, Mealy Cup Sage makes a little bit, and Sage makes none. 
So even within the same genus, you get this difference related to mucilage. So for a number of reasons, we selected these four to look at. Um, and I'll go through each one of these to give you an idea why we chose these. This is a, a relative size difference in the seeds, just so you have an idea. Uh, coleus produces quite a round fruit, uh, smaller than the others. Uh, the other seeds are, are kind of linear, and it goes up in size, and hyptus is really quite large. It's easy to work with, quite large. So back to uh, uh, Chia. This is a little different uh, video of what goes on here. It's fascinating to watch the, the, the mucilage come out because it gets kind of all energetic. And, and that's really what's happening. I'll show you here. It's really coming out in, in, in coils. Uh, we've done the biochemistry uh, on all of these except for the coleus. We didn't do the coleus. Um, I don't want to spend much time on that. I want to get to, to some of the stuff that's a little more fun. Uh, but these are pectinaceous polysaccharides. There is this cellulosic boundary. And oftentimes you can see uh, halos. So there are multiple layers here. You can see this with the chia. Uh, we know what the, what the, the polysaccharides here are. Um, we've done that kind of biochemistry. But like I said, I'd rather show you what it looks like morphologically. So this is what it looks like during development. The tissue levels layers here are the seed coat, the endocarp, and then the outer pericarp. And this is during development. And you can see what's happening. It's packing in the mucilage in the outer layer of cells in the pericarp. If you look at Arabidopsis, it looks very similar to that. Uh, this is a germinating seed now, or an imbibing seed. Uh, this is about 10 seconds after imbibition. We can fix it, so it stops. And when you make the section, you can see what's happening here, right? Again, we've got the seed coat and the endocarp. The endocarp uh, layer stays intact. But the upper pericarp wall is now being lifted off by the hydrating mucilage. And it literally throws that off as the mucilage expands. What you're going to see here is a wave of water that comes over and hits this strip of pericarp and seed coat. And the mucilage just keeps going and going and going. I don't know if we'll see this again or I mentioned it, but you, you often see this kind of thing, these, these that adhere. Those are cells that didn't make mucilage. Not every cell makes mucilage for whatever reason. And if you don't make mucilage, you don't blow your lid. And so they stay attached to the, the pericarp. This is uh, the outer surface. And I just find this to be tremendous. You can see all of the coils. And on a per volume basis, it is a tremendous amount of material. It just keeps going and going and going. And this is a single layer of tissue in the pericarp. So these are, are uh, you, you'll see why I say it in a second, but these are just these coils or strands. They're quite uh, narrow in diameter, but they're produced in copious amounts. And again, here, here you can see those cells that, that didn't produce that, that stay uh, attached. Oh, here, here's probably a better view of that. So here, this is a cell that never made mucilage, so it remains more or less intact while everything else goes. The other thing that, that is, uh, you see with all of these mucilage producing, uh, seeds, uh, is that it remains tethered 
to the lower pericarp wall. So it sticks. It doesn't just float out into the, the, the soil matrix. If you look at this at the EM level, uh, you can see here this is the outer pericarp. You can see these cells here that, that form one individual cell. And there's the mucilage that uh, in this particular uh, sequence hadn't yet hydrated as much as the rest of the cells. Uh, so you can see how it's kind of packed in there, right? This is a few minutes uh, after the mucilage has been produced. Uh, again, an EM, and all it's really depicting here is that it is truly tethered to that lower pericarp wall. So here's the lower pericarp wall. And here you can see the, the mucilage as it's, it remains tethered. All right, so that's that. That's what I I, I had worked on. This is what I knew for chia. It was kind of interesting, but when I was down in Central America, uh, the students and I discovered Chan, and Chan looks a whole lot like chia, doesn't it? Well, it turns out that it is uh, in the Lamiaceae, it's Hyptus, uh, and it is uh, one of these drinks as well that, that people consume on a regular basis in Central America. Uh, it's also in India and Africa. It is a high fiber producer, just the way uh, chia is, and on a volume basis it produces more because it's a larger uh, fruit. Uh, but on a quality basis, it's not quite the same quality from a human nutrition standpoint as chia is. Uh, but it is, a, again, consumed as a health food drink. So someday you may see hyptus replacing chia. Well, what we found out pretty quickly is mucilage looks different depending on what plant we're looking at. Uh, so there it is in, in, uh, in chan or hyptus. It tends to be larger and looks like morphologically it's made a little differently. And it is. Uh, it is still a coiled type of a, a strand of mucilage, but it is much more tightly uh, packed together than what we see in the chia. And there I think very nicely you can see the coils, right? And I love this because it's a lot more energetic than chia. It really starts twisting around. Enough so that it actually gets modal and starts to move around in the petri dish, right? Swimming seeds. Same deal again, the pericarp strip as the water hits it. And I think you can see here, right? It is a much thicker uh, mucilage strand than what you saw in Chia. So it turns out, as I started to look around for these drinks in the Lamiaceae, that uh, what you see, especially in Asia, is that basil is one of the preferred drinks. Same kind of a deal. It's even in the same kind of bottle we can buy in the U.S. as you saw with the chia. Um, it is, a, again, a good source of fiber. Uh, not as good as chia. Still, chia seems to be better than, than either basil or uh, chan. But obviously a mucilage producer, right? And right there, just with the tualidine blue stain, you can tell this one's going to be different. It, it's my favorite. So uh, I'm biased. But it's, it's my favorite. So this, this one's a little misleading, right? Because it's actually covering the seed. Well, it is in the other ones too. We just don't optically see it. This one is made of material that makes it more optically obvious that it's three-dimensional and covering the seed. But this is why it's my favorite. When I saw this under the microscope, I had to go out and find somebody and say, come and look and see at this mucilage. It's very entertaining. So this is what this one looks like. 
it puts out these needle-like strands and inside you get this row of vesicles that just keep migrating out and you'll see did you see the one shoot out so like I said very entertaining and when it gets to the end they'll actually come out we don't know what these are yet but they will escape from the, the, the little mucilage package per se. But we don't get the same coiling and curving. We get these long strands with these vesicles in it. And I do believe they are vesicles because they look like they are membrane bound. They don't look like air bubbles. And especially when they emerge from the end, they don't like just disappear. So it's not just air inside. Or maybe it is, but. I'm told with the new confocal microscope we're getting that I'll be able to see these better and, and maybe have a better idea what we're looking at. This is the EM picture of it. Uh, so these are lots of little strands. And if you look right in here, I think you can see the little uh, vesicles. If I blow it up, it becomes even more obvious how many of these vesicles are in these strands. So I, I like those. I, I didn't hear any oohs and ahs or nothing. I just... <laughs> and here it comes. Not yet. You got to see the vesicle. <laughs> now you can ooh and ah. <laughs> and what's interesting to me is it doesn't look like they're just being pushed along in the mucilage. It looks like they're traveling inside a lumen that's in the center of these. So it, it just, it, it kind of blows me away because now we've looked at three random members of the Lamiaceae and they're all different, right? So what chances are that coleus will be different? Well, it's going to be different. We don't eat uh, coleus, but uh, interestingly, there are a number of members of the Lamiaceae that have psychoactive properties. So the students aren't supposed to hear that. So again, now you can see, obviously the mucilage is going to look different. Uh, this, the, the fruit itself is, is a little different in shape. Uh, and here's one that's fully hydrated. And to, to kind of cut to the chase, the reason these look different is because the upper pericarp wall doesn't get launched away from the seed. It stays tethered. So there you can see it's like little hats tethered to the ends of the, the mucilage. And if you get really close up, you can see it. And it is, again, much different because you get this kind of compact group of mucilage and a strand. And then the upper pericarp wall. This one you can nicely see the isodiametric shape of the, uh, the cell in the outer pericarp wall. So when I first did this, I wasn't sure we were going to see any mucilage. Instead of like the other ones where everything happens at once, now you randomly get one to pop up here and there. and More like a solar flare than a, a full-out mucilage attack. But eventually, the entire fruit is covered with these little mucilage in its cap. And you can see them, they'll just pop out. <laughs> so I hope uh, that you've seen mucilages can be fun um, and hopefully next time I can put mucilage in the title because we really need to respect the mucilage right? I don't do all of this work myself uh, David Hildebrand is the lipid biochemist who's really instigated the research Tim Phillips is the breeder who designed the uh, uh, day neutral plants. Sharon is my research technician and these are a group of students that contributed one way or other to the project as it went along. So that's it. I'm very happy to answer any questions.